really um, my pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to do over, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so is talk and build a lot about what you heard from, from Rob and Richard, which is, first off, that um, speed really trumps and will beat slow every time. And that's, that's really what this market transition that we're seeing happen and it's all about. It used to be that big trumped small. If you were a big organization, you had lots of resource, whether that was financial capital, whether it was um, equipment, whether it was people, and you could you could tend to outperform and, and really kind of beat down the little guy. That's really not the case anymore. And as you heard Richard talk about Uber, what we're talking about now is organizations that are more effectively leveraging applications and data, really putting themselves ahead. And so what I'll take you through today is um, a bit, make sure I get the buttons right here, uh, a bit about first, so the other thing I have to do as an analyst at IDC is use the term third platform at least once. So what our vision is around third platform and what that means, I'll, I'll set the stage there, and then I'll talk about what does it mean for the business of IT, and then what does it mean for the infrastructure that we put underneath this digital business, and how's that evolving and changing, and what does that need to look like in order to be future-proofed for where we see the industries that we're in going. So to start, and we've touched on some of this already, you can imagine, based on what's happening in this world, and I'll preview a little bit behind what's, what the third platform's all about. That is really a notion that as an industry, we're really at the third major inflection point in, in our industry since it was created in the mid-60s. Say with the advent of the mainframe in the mid-60s. First platform was really around the uh, mainframe and terminals and, and really connecting uh, departments inside of organizations. Second platform was client service. Uh, client server came around in the 80s and the 90s, and that was really about extending that model outside of your company to include partners and customers. And the third platform is really around a bunch of forces that are coming together, but the two biggest ones are mobile and cloud and how, what they really set up and enable us to do. So we see all this disruption happening in the industry, and I think Uber is a great example, and I'll reference that. I'll also reference uh, Tesla, but I'll also reference GE and some of the things that are happening in kind of very traditional industries uh, as we move forward into this, into this world of the third platform. But you can see it's all about going fast, it's all about efficiency, and it's, it's even about taking out a lot of excess capacity. So think about that middle bullet as, as you think about the development of self-driving cars, these autos, these services like Uber, Uber or Zipcar, you, you name your service, and all of a sudden, the need to have a second or third car in your household goes away. Uh, Rob was talking about his friend's daughter you know, running away with Uber. I mean, my daughter's 18 years old, and she has her driver's license, but she's way, way more connected to her smartphone, and she would never give that up. She really, almost, I almost had to twist her arm a little bit to get her license. It's really interesting to see how different kids are today. So in this digital economy, it's about going fast. Fast beats slow. It's really all about um, developing and building new customer experiences. So you hear a lot of people talking about business outcomes and starting with the business outcome and then working back to, okay, well, that's what we're trying to achieve. How are we going to achieve it? And then what kind of technology is it going to take to actually help us achieve that? It's about efficiency. A big part of what I'm talking about, and you'll hear other analysts talk about this, is we have a first and second platform business that's been, that's been built, and that doesn't go away, but we need to extend it, and we need to extend it in a way that's uber efficient, but also makes, makes and takes um, uh, control of what's actually been developed so far. So it's about improving operational efficiencies to free up budget and free up capital that can be reallocated into some new programs and new projects. And I'll share some budget information with you in order to kind of drive that point home. So as a, as a starting point, does your organization, so we're gonna do the first polling question, does your organization have a digital business strategy? And so you are requested to text A for yes or B for no, and then we'll see how this works as I do a little tap dance. Uh, but basically, where we're going to go next in this presentation is, is to start to talk a little bit about how, well, good, it looks like uh, two to one or so on the yes versus no. And so I think that's really important. I mean, we're talking about 
something that impacts all industries. And you'll hear examples about automotive, you'll hear examples about hospitality with Airbnb, you'll hear examples about what's happening in the world of education and how, and how disruptive potentially the education model gets when you start to think about some of these um, new tools that are coming online. So this is a good, good starting point. What I'm also gonna do today is benchmark where we see all of you so you get a sense for uh, you know, where you are relative to peers. And as I know, probably the, the single biggest uh, uh, group of, of folks that really influence all of you beyond reading uh, trade pubs and talking to analysts and all that are actually peers. So the con connections you have with other folks that have gone through some of these transitions are really important. So this digital economy that we're talking about, if you, know, if, if you haven't figured it out, it's something that's pretty important. But it's really about a number of things. One is returning value to shareholders. So there's, there's good value in being able to make some of these transitions and obviously build that $50 billion market cap in six years. It is very much, and this one's probably as important as anything, taking an ecosystem first approach to building this. So it's not about focusing just inside of your organization. It's about looking outside and what you can leverage out there. So again, with the, with the example you heard from earlier from Richard, Uber picked up off, you know, kind of off-the-shelf commercial parts and built their business. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to actually leverage what's out there. It's very much about data. This is really a data-based economy, and it's about leveraging that data in a unique way that helps your business uh, in, in new and interesting ways. So what's, and, and also it's about, it's about augmenting third-party data that you can in the marketplace to help you um, with some of these transitions that are happening. People. A lot of this is about talent. It's about acquiring the right people, namely developers, and, and actually acquiring some of this talent ahead of when you actually need it. So it's, it's thinking ahead because there's going to be a huge talent war. And the talent war for, for programmers and developers isn't just coming out of the IT ecosystem. It's coming out of the BUs, and you'll hear me talk about that. And then finally, it's about profitability. If you do all these things well, then profits will come. So question number two, has your organization made any organizational changes in order to get ready for this digital economy? So as much as this, so A for yes and B for no, and as much as this is about technology, and we're talking a lot about technology the next few days, this is also about people and process and making changes in how we put those people and those processes together. I mean, I think that's, that's a good sign as well, because I would say a lot of folks don't tend to think ahead to the organizational aspect of what's, what's, what's required. They tend to focus on what's happening just inside of their core team. And a lot of what I'm talking about here, and a lot of the change that I'm ta I'll be talking about, does require support from above. It requires a vision, and it requires executive support for the change. Don't resist the change. Actually think about how, for example, virtualization uh, changed how we how we manage a data center. If you had resisted that, you'd probably not be in a very good position right now. But if you embraced it, you probably actually grew and increased the value of your career. And it's thinking that way across how we can extend this this infrastructure model in in new ways. So business initiatives. So just to kind of pivot on this, this is a survey question of IT leaders, so managers, directors, VPs, and CIOs that we did uh, back in January and. You can see that a lot of the objectives that you're all trying to achieve in your business line up pretty well with what I shared on the chart before the polling question. So it is about productivity, it's about reducing costs, it's about improving business processes and increasing revenue. So here's the, here's the third platform chart. I already kind of teased what first, second, and third mean. What we're really focused on at IDC now is really what happens on top of this. So it's not the fact that we have mobile, it's not the fact that we have cloud, it's what you can actually build on top of that mobile cloud. And these are new types of services that are very much about apps and data, as I said, but it's really about how you engage with your customer. So lots of transformations in what that engagement model looks like. It's also, and you'll hear me talk about this as well, IoT. So IoT is the sort of the latest buzzword or hype word that you'll hear people talk about, but it's very real. 
It's being able to start to instrument your business in ways that's never happened before. So it's machine-based and people-based. You have an engagement model over here. You have an administration and automation model over here. It's about taking those data feeds and creating a real-time analytics model around that data that can feed your decision-making in the business. And if you do this with the speed that's required, it also allows you to change how you innovate and also how you think about building a new lifecycle oriented service. So you don't, you don't want to think of yourself about being in a point in time business where you're selling a product or service once. Instead, you want to extend the life cycle of connectivity around that, around that service or product across its life cycle. So Tesla is a great example. They, they don't just sell you the car. They're actually selling you the car, but they're using more of the iPhone model where they're continually updating the software so that that car gets better and better, where a typical car, over the seven years you might own it, slowly gets worse and worse. Right, so this is, this is about turning that on, on its side. So you've probably, how many people here have heard of uh, Clayton Christensen and the Innovator's Dilemma? All right, fair number. So he's a professor at Harvard Business School, and he wrote a book that's often, uh, often referenced in technology discussions about how we can be disrupted if we're not aware of what's coming, coming up from below. He used an example, one of his examples was around disk drives, but he also used an example around mini mills and steel. And these, these small steel plants were able to do some of the things that big plants could do, but really not all of it. They started off with rebar, and then over time they got better and better, and they started getting into rolled steel and then, and then to I-beams. And before you knew it, they were actually more efficient at delivering steel to the market than the big plants. Well, there's also a, a, a company, and I'm from Boston, there's, a, research, there's a, a consulting company that spun off of uh, Clayton Christensen's work that's called Intersight. And Intersight takes those, those kind of theories and puts them into practice in the marketplace. And this is a slide that's made its way around uh, the social universe on Twitter the last couple of years. But es essentially, it's looking at what's happening with the S&P 500. And you, you see references to this all the time. This is the speed part of what we're talking about, where back in the mid-60s, when that first mainframe came out of IBM, it was about a 61-year average tenure on the S&P 500. It's, we're heading to a point where it's about 18 years. And you can kind of see there are cycles in this pattern of new companies coming online, disrupting old. And it kind of fits with this first, second, and third platform story to the point where when you get out to 2027, 75% of the companies on the S&P 500 today won't be there anymore. Some of them will have failed. Many of them will be acquired, but oftentimes there'll be new companies that come along that build up not only big valuations, but also more relevancy to what our economy looks like as we continually put new, new folks into the S&P 500 to represent what our economy looks like. Oops. So you've seen this maybe as well, where you know, Radio Shack, obviously not a very great name for a business today, only to be outdone in the UK by Car Phone Warehouse. Also not a very good, a good name for a company today. But Radio Shack you know, did a great job of selling point products when we bought our first color television, our first you know, wire, you know, uh, mobile telephones, our first computers, you name it. They were there, they, provided, they, provided the, they sold the products, they provided the service around that. But today, everything that's on this ad from roughly 25 years ago is now an app on your phone for free. You could buy the premium versions for probably eight or nine bucks, but that's all, all capability that's built into software now on a device like an iPhone or a, a Samsung device. So what happens? Well, it's adios to Radio Shack. And what happened to those Radio Shack stores? Well, some of them, a good, a good number of them were actually sold to Sprint and they, they're becoming mobile storefronts for, uh, for, uh, for Sprint. So it's the evolution from a fixed, you know, fixed, you know, kind of model that was about selling product to more of a mobile model that, that's de developing today. So you'll, I think all the Red 8 people will love this. So IT initiatives. What are the top IT initiatives in 2015? Well, forever. Security's been on top of that, that list. What's changing here is cloud is rising up. So a few years ago, you probably would have seen cloud more middle of the pack. Consolidation and virtualization is beginning to trickle down a little. 
because it's it's become such an integral part of what we do. It's not the top uh, focus area for a lot of IT organizations. And if you were to ask me what's going to change on this next, I would say definitely mobile enablement will continue to work its way up this list. And also um, data analytics is going to keep working its way up this list as well. Those become so important and so critical to building these digital businesses. So you'll see, you'll continue to see evolution in those areas. On the challenges side, all my Red 8 friends, you're going to love this too. Top IT challenge, security. Also, budget constraints. So this is, an, I think, maybe an important time to mention that when we think about transformation and we think about evolution and the fact that very little in this industry is ever thrown away, we, we spend a lot, of, a lot of energy kind of evolving from some starting point. Uh, budget constraints is an important one because we've tended to think about, at least recently, IT as a means for achieving efficiency in our business, a means for getting um, improve, improving productivity across whatever whatever business we're in. If you're in a consulting business, it's about making humans more more efficient. If you're in manufacturing, it's about running a more effective factory floor. But to make the transition to the to the third platform in this in this digital enterprise, it's going to take more than that. It's going to take people thinking about IT as an investment area. Clearly, that's what Uber did. Uber thought, hey, we can disrupt something as state as taxis if we invest some money in customer experience and make it a better customer experience. So it wasn't ever about taking, taking cost out, it was about adding new value at the customer experience level. So third polling question for me is, who do you think will lead your digital transformation? Will it be IT or it will, be, will it be the line of business? So IT is A and LOB will be B. A is um, IT and line of business is B. It's a little bit of a trick question because I think it has to be both, but I don't want to influence anybody. But I think um, clearly it's a very different conversation that you'll have to have with the business for this to, uh, to work effectively. So wow, that's good. Okay, so you're gonna see two other things and I'm gonna be you know, full disclosure up front from me as an analyst. One is a maturity model, which is this, and then a little bit later on, a two-by-two two matrix, which you know we have to show those as well. Maturity model, though. If you think about this transformation we're on, and this is where I'm going to start to benchmark for all of you where your peers are and where, where, where you, how you should think of yourself in this, this transformation. So way down on the left, and this is, again, making that pivot from second platform to third, so traditional client server into this mobile cloud digital uh, transform, transformed world that we're talking about today. Ad hoc would be folks that are really making no effort there. In the middle, you have folks that I would describe as opportunistic and repeatable. The opportunistic folks are doing this in a way that's a bit uncoordinated, but they're starting to see some results. And in the repeatable world, it's coordinated and actually they're able to keep up with what's happening in their peers. So they're not being left behind. And you go all the way out to the right, and you start to play out the maturity a bit more. In the managed world, it's about an effective partnership between IT and the line of business, and actually being able to distance yourself from the competition. And op optimized is really sustained differentiation against the competition, something that it's going to take a while for somebody to catch up with Uber, for example. So funding all this, this is where things start to get interesting. So being an infrastructure and data center guy, any survey question I ask any time roughly will show the same thing, that about 80% of your IT budget goes into what we would describe as maintenance, keeping what you have up and running, and only about 20% uh, is actually going into innovation. So investing in some of these new transformational areas. So that's an IT perspective. That's the perspective of the IT budget that you control and heavily influence. There's more that's actually spent on technology than just what is in your purview, and that's things that happen out of the... Out of not hugely different, but about 40% over there is actually going into uh, innovation. So things like uh, marketing analytics, you hear a lot of people talk about how the CMO is going to have a bigger budget, technology budget, than the CIO. I don't know if that's true or not, but 
that that's one of the predictors that people are making. And that's basically, again, that engagement model becomes so important to the business and how it's done that the CMO will have more influence over how that happens. If you put this all together, then it's not quite 80-20, it's 70-30. So it's not great, but it's a little bit better. And then in a few more slides, I'll show you what the impact of shadow IT is as well. So the point here is there's money being spent on technology beyond the view of everyone in this room, but, but for organizations to, to succeed and make this transformation, this, this has to be done in some kind of concert, some balance, some coordination for this to be effective. So to, to come back to, to where we were, uh, about 40% are actually in the second platform IT world and about 27% are making the transition to third platform. So most, two thirds, are in, this, in the middle of making this transition from second to third, which is what you'd expect in a maturity model. I'm gonna also focus just a little bit on these innovators in a bit and show you kind of what they look like. So this transformation requires three big things. Moving outside your, your comfort zone, so this gets into a conversation about people and process and how that may need to change, how you're organized. Um, cultivating IT's future IT talent today for uh, actually looking ahead and starting to build, the, build those capabilities into your organizations and then delivering technology the way that the business wants and needs. So that feeds into the conversation that needs to happen between IT and the business about what these new digital services are gonna look like and what the, and then it's your job to understand what kind of, how to platform that, what kind of infrastructure to put under that. So just to use kind of automotive, automotive again for a model here, obviously we've seen an automotive industry go through lots of transition, we've seen uh, the, you know, you're basically going into a dealership if you're buying or leasing a car and telling the dealer what you're willing to pay because this information's widely available. So the dealer is trying to make up the money by building a more effective service model and, and kind of building a life cycle service around you and that car. What Tesla does is actually builds that a little bit further and they take it and they build an IT enabled product. And you actually see conversations around automotive manufacturers using the marketplace to decide what kind of features to build into a car. What Tesla's doing is putting it in software, which makes it incredibly fluid in terms of how those new capabilities are actually delivered to you as an owner. So that car is constantly changing. On the talent management side, here's, here's really the big one that, that you have to focus on. And that is that finding people to do these next gen jobs that have these next gen skills is not easy. It's gonna, it's gonna require very aggressive recruiting, but it's also gonna be, require some change in culture for a lot of companies to even make, these, make your companies attractive to the folks you're trying to hire. You're not just competing with the Facebooks and Twitters of the world, but you're competing with a marketplace that's increasingly seeing a number of things kind of collide together. So you'll hear people, and you're gonna see this from me, Analysts talk about convergence in the data center, compute, storage, network coming together. But there's a bigger convergence that's happening in the marketplace. And that's the world of IT and those standard IT building blocks that all of you know are moving into CT or communications technologies. So the Alcatel Lucent of the world will not be delivering on a sustained basis product to the, tel to the telcos that's uniquely different from what's happening in the IT world. The IT building block moves into CT. The IT building block will also move into what I call OT, or embedded technologies. And those are, I think, products that you might buy from, from GE or, or Siemens or you name your favorite kind of industrial supplier. They're increasingly going to have more IT componentry inside. So they're going to be fighting for a lot of the same development talent that, that all of you will be fighting for. So which roles are hard to, hardest to fill? Well, enterprise architects are a really tough one. And enterprise architecture is going through probably some of its biggest changes in really a generation. Business intelligence and analytics or data chief, you know, kind of data scientist types, again, very difficult people to find. And folks that are really good at managing change. So IT management and IT executives that can help an organization change from inside out will also be in high demand in the next few years. So to use an example, and here's an example with Kaiser, 
to do this, they've actually had to kind of change what they look and feel like to the outside world. So building more contemporary workspace, going out and actually working on connecting with employees on mission. I mentioned my 18-year-old daughter having just gone through the process of scouting out colleges. It's amazing what colleges are hitting students with today. A lot of it's about experience, a lot of it's about community, a lot of it's about giving back, a lot of it's about internship. So they're looking at ways to connect and add value and make a difference. And, and that's what these younger, younger employees are thinking about as well. So here's the shadow IT piece. So I don't have this as a polling question, and maybe the answers will look different, but if I ask IT, how much you think gets spent outside of the purview of IT? The answer would be about 6%. In reality, if we factor in what really is happening out there, it's 16. So it's not, it's not dramatically different, but it's enough different that, again, there's another source of spending in the world of shadow IT that needs to be brought back in in concert with what's happening in the world of IT. So value shifts to the data center. And you see this with the world of big, of big data, with mobile, with, with uh, cloud. But you also see it with what's happening in the world of IoT and the instrumentation of the business. And it's changing a lot of the things that make up and comprise the data center. So cloud, virtualization, SDN, all kinds of, all kinds of software to find everything become really critical things here. And when we talk to folks about this, and service providers will tell us that they see that their cloud strategy is very clear. So in this case, this wasn't a Google or a Microsoft. This was a, a, a value-added reseller or an SI that's telling us that we want to enable multi-cloud. We believe that our customers are going to live in a world that's multi-cloud, and that's, that's going to be our differentiation. We're going to allow them to go where they need to go with their business. From edge to core, huge transformations and, and challenges that will happen in your data centers. So open source hardware and software are becoming more important building blocks in the world of cloud, and we think that has an influence on your own data centers. I'm not a believer by any means, and I'll show this in a minute, that everything moves to the cloud. I think it's very much a hybrid strategy that develops for most folks. But there'll be lots of influence from that hyperscale world on the technologies that are being brought into your data centers. Uh, applications and analytics run adjacent to compute. I don't know what Val's going to talk about next, but clearly the world of storage is changing because we're seeing data and processing being put closer and closer together. And certainly the world of solid state and flash is having huge impacts on storage. Resource management at a VM or container level, how we build next generation applications, whether they're highly componentized or whether they're more of a traditional VM framework, we're probably going to want to manage those in a way that, that's a bit seamless so that we can manage them all together. So IoT, and I mentioned that we're moving from an era that where we, we built our, our technology and our infrastructure to support really a finite number of people but an expanding number of data processes that live on top of all of us, all the things that we connect with. We're entering an era that's really going to be increasingly about machines. So there are, are you know, a finite number of people on the planet, about half of them are connected to the internet today, and most forecasts have that going to about three quarters of all people by 2020. This IoT thing that's relatively in its infancy is really going to take off. And so you'll see people talking about you know, you know, how many personal devices we even own. So today, a typical person controls about three devices. In 2020, it's probably six. When you start to play out what's happening in your home and how many things are hanging off your own home Wi-Fi, it goes staggeringly large. And that's just the consumer piece. If you start to think about what happens in the commercial world, it's even bigger, potentially, in terms of what's happening in terms of the instrumentation of any business in any industry. So this is really about connecting all this information in instrumenting the business at a really fundamentally important level. It's about building new algorithms to make use and make sense of that data, to control the business based on what's coming out of that data. It's very much about optimizing the IT for efficiency, for utilization in this world that's in incredibly fluid, but it's also about building new types of services, as I mentioned. So a good example here would be GE. So GE is a company we all know. We might think of them as an industrial conglomerate. We might think of them as a financial services 
a conglomerate. They're all of those things, but what they're in the middle of doing is transitioning how, how they see themselves and how customers see them from a provider of big product, like jet engines and locomotives and power turbines, to really a, a life cycle service provider. So instead of selling the engine to, to United Airlines, they actually want to sell hours of power. And they actually want to own the asset, and, they, and it puts the, the onus on, on, on GE to become more efficient at delivering those hours of power. It also puts the risk on them. But they're going to use data, and they're going to use analytics on how those engines are operating to increasingly throw more efficiency at the, at the curve. And that becomes their margin. That becomes how they're able to make better profit. And they're putting a lot of money into this, and they're building their own cloud to do this. So the evolution, it goes from something that's really been kind of hardware defined to really software defined. And, and we've, you know, we've talked about smartphones and there's more power in that, in that iPhone or that, that Samsung phone on your desk than there is uh, there was on Apollo 11 when we went to the moon. So the amount of power in our hands is huge, but it's backed up in data center with even more power. And we're moving this world from something that was very static to something that's very dynamic. It's about moving from fixed users to mobile users. Presence becomes a big piece of this. Moving from very heterogeneous architectures to very homogeneous architectures. So there's a big shift that happens that connects everything in the data center and makes, and makes that data center much more, it needs to be much more of a software-defined type of a data center or infrastructure. So this is kind of extending off that virtualization model that we've been doing with compute and starting to extend it into storage extending it into network where we're using software to really abstract the resource in the data center and, and really kind of connect that, that abstracted resource back to the applications that we're going to be running. So it's about putting just enough infrastructure to that application. And this will happen in parallel with other things that happen in hardware. So you'll see lots of focus in the industry around disaggregation or composable type of infrastructures where you can start to mix the right amount of processing, the right amount of memory, the right amount of disk with, with workloads and use software to really kind of define those resources. So you build up a set of resources that are virtualized for that application and you tear them down in real time. So that's the world we're heading into. It's gonna take us some time to get there, but clearly we're trying to do with our data center what we've already done with our phones. We're seeing the workloads change. So workloads go from Something that's really about um, really, really deeply embedded in the in the core. The applications are kind of written in the infrastructure. Is something that's abstracted and componentized. And you see lots of focus on things like containers um, and, and new types of microservices that people are using to build these services. So there's a lot happening on these next gen applications that are really aimed at building out and supporting a lot of these digital transformations that will happen in the business. So here's my two by two. It's pretty simple. If I were to ask all of you and, and you're platforming a new application or a new service, where are you gonna put it, on-prem or off? And how are you gonna run it in a traditional environment or in a pooled or shared environment? That's probably the most reasonable way to get at the conversation around cloud today. And what you're all telling us is today it roughly looks like this. If you had 100% of your resource, how are you gonna, how are you gonna allocate it? In reality, that public cloud piece is already quite a bit bigger than that, but most of what's running in the public cloud today is what I would describe as consumer mobile oriented and not enterprise oriented. But for an enterprise, this is what things look like. If I was to ask you how this is gonna change in the next few years, you would tell me that most of the growth is gonna be off-prem. Actually, I have other data that suggests the private cloud keeps going up as well, but the bottom line is that traditional and a siloed IT piece continues to shrink, and the shift is into shared, pooled resource, both on and off prem. So if you put a workloads perspective on that, then obviously you have some applications that are very high value to you, and those are gonna be the applications that you're the most conservative with moving, and they're gonna to tend to stay more on-prem. Some of them might even stand, stay in this dedicated world a little bit longer. They're, they're hard to virtualize, they're hard to move, and maybe they're not super bursty and the resource requirements are manageable, so you kind of leave things the way they are. Okay, so we use the term integrated at IDC. What we mean is converged. 
You can do this in a couple of different ways, and I'm going to also explain where the hyperconverged piece fits. But clearly, there's an infrastructure piece of this, and that's think think of your uh, your FlexPod type of example. I don't know if Val's going to go into that or not, but think about that type of an example where the compute networking, the storage are all integrated, and these things are really optimized to run VMs extremely efficiently. So you run at really high rates of utilization. The platform piece is where you start to go higher up the stack and you're mixing middleware and database in there and you're making these things very, very effective at running a specific application. Generally speaking, it's something like OLTP or database. Oracle's doing a lot of work there. You can do this single vendor, you can do a multi-vendor, there are lots of ways of doing it. If you play it out, so this integrated infrastructure space, is, and that's where most of the spend is today, that's the transition from traditional to shared services for all of your existing, what I would describe as second platform applications. So how do you get super efficient? One of my colleagues calls this the liposuction of, of the data center. It's like, where do you suck out the fat and how do you free up the resource to invest in new infrastructure for new applications? Integrated platform, as I said, is really about going after very specific applications that have very unique resource requirements and putting a platform in place that's optimized to run that well. And then hyperconverge comes along, and that's a bit different. What we've seen playing there is, is more of a follow-on to what's been happening in the virtualized world. And oftentimes, there is a target application that tends to drive this deployment first. And many times, it's something like VDI, virtual desktop, that will drive it. And then it tends to expand on to over time. But this is really the beginnings, the hyperconverge, of that software-defined play. It's taking the, the software stack that we run in the infrastructure, in this case, it's generally the, the storage stack and consolidating and optimizing it to run on general purpose x86 systems. So the benefits of all this, get back, it gets back to speed. It's about agility, it's about speed, it's about cost. And what you tend to see is people going from traditional to virtualized to converged. And the amount of time it takes to spin up a new service goes down dramatically each time. And the more aspirational piece of this on the right, and this is a little bit backwards in terms of time, when it says time to provision, the time to provision gets shorter as you work your way down this chart. But cloud and software defined is, is a world where we'll live in minutes to provision these services. But the benefits here are on the productivity side for, for both IT as well as for the business because these tend to be more highly available services. They tend to be easier to manage. Again, it's future-proofing your data center for and optimizing it for the last mile of virtualization in the early, in the early stages of what's going to happen in the third platform digital transformation. So when we ask people about challenges, these are, these are in colors for a reason because some of these are what I would describe as technology challenges, some are organizational challenges, and some are simply around awareness. So the first one on cost and doubt around ROI is really easy to solve. We've got plenty of research we've done that shows the benefit of this. But you do get into challenges around things like refresh cycles. So that gets into conversations around how frequently do you refresh your compute, your storage, your network. And what it's really saying is those are different decision makers and that we're struggling with kind of who controls that decision making. The companies that are doing this well and are, are well out of the maturity curve when it comes to integrated or converged have, have lasted past that and they've made the organizational changes they need in order to do this well. So here's the 80-20 thing that I started off with. When you look at tasks that, that you're doing in your data centers today, and this pie chart kind of breaks out those typical tasks, whether it's uh, innovation on new projects or or patching and provisioning and kind of maintaining and managing machines. You see things like vendor and internal meetings taking up a lot of time. These are things that can be solved for through the shift towards converged and then ultimately to uh, software-defined type, type of infrastructures. The belief is that you can save about 25% of your time from a shift towards more of a converged architecture. And we think that this translates into about, you know, about a week's worth of time per admin. So this is about, it's not about eliminating people. It's about freeing up people to add more value. And I think you heard um, Rob mention that one earlier as well. In terms of organization, what I'd say here is, you know, again, get out in front and make some of the changes that need to happen. 
61% of the people that we're talking to about convergence say that these server and storage and network groups need to merge or, or will merge. 59% uh, believe that the dev teams will become more responsible for some of the decisions that are made around IT automation and configuration management. And 45% believe that the business units will take on more control and more influence over how, what IT ops look like and what the overall provisioning and purchasing of technology looks like. So there's a lot of change that's happening here, and a lot of it stems from that organizational discussion that I started with. So we already touched on most of this, aligning, lower costs, simplifying, and reducing. But well, here's the real, the real kind of kicker in terms of economics, is this is about selling flexibility. It's about selling time, being able to go faster and also reliability for less money. So this is about consolidation in a way where you can run more workload on fewer compute instances, few, uh, less overall storage capacity, and less network ports. It's about taking up less physical space in the data center and less energy in the data center. So you get these benefits of flexibility and time and reliability at a lower cost. So it's pretty easy to actually sell these types of projects internally. And it does tend to be seen as an extension of the virtualization journey you've been on, where you've, you get to a point where you're 90, 95% virtualized, and you start to ask yourself, well, what do I do next? How do I save money in the future? Where do I go to save to invest in these, in these new next-gen applications? So final polling question for me is, are you using any, um, any public uh, cloud services today? Yes for A, A for yes, and B for no. And this one's, again, this one's a tough one because I'm not surprised to see the number so high, but um, there's cloud everywhere, right? And, uh, you know, in terms of um, SaaS, if whether you're using Salesforce or, or um, Office 365, there's an awful lot of cloud out there already in the SaaS world. I think where it starts to get very interesting in the future is more about how do we build these next generation applications? Do we pick a pass player? Who's that, whose pass are we gonna use when we build these applications? And then again, what's, the in, what's my model around infrastructure as a service, and how does that connect to what I'm gonna do on-prem? I'm a big believer, if you kind of tie this all back with the conversation around automobiles, that most people are going to want to own their base load and rent their peak. So if, I'm, if I drive 100,000 miles a year, I'm not gonna use Uber, I'm gonna buy a car. But if I need a car a couple times a week, then I'm gonna rent it, so it's that kind of analogy. All right, so just to wrap this thing up, so third platform technologies are really already fueling this transformation. And if you play ahead to 2020, um, we think that analytics have an awful lot of room to, to potentially drive a lot more productivity in our businesses if it's done correctly. Mobility, huge amount of impact in terms of how we engage and how we deliver on these, uh, these uh, experiences for customers and how we make the customers part of the overall model in terms of cradle to grave for these uh, life cycle services. And then, of course, um, social is kind of an extension for how this conversation happens and, and what's out there in the public domain. So selling your service, it's really about what you communicate as much as how. So it's, it's again, working with your businesses differently than you have in the past and driving a little bit different type of, type of conversation. And then the benefits around the business are operational efficiency, productivity for employees, uh, greater loyalty from customers, again, by building in those lifecycle services so that they're you know, incredibly sticky. And I think a lot of these next-gen businesses that are emerging, the Ubers and Teslas of the world, are doing a great job of building customer loyalty. Uh, developing new revenue streams are also very important here. So just a final, final comments from me. This is about balance. This is not easy. I'm not here to just to say, well, your jobs are easy. They're not. But if you're in the position of a CIO, it is about generally balancing budget, time, and people. Those are the resources that you have. And if you're going to go faster in one area, you need to borrow in another. So it's about doing things differently in the world of second platform in order to free up resource for that third platform investment that you need to make. The workloads of the applications are hugely important, and they're big, critical decision points. So go back to that two by two matrix. Some things will fit much better on-prem, some off, some in a more of a traditional environment, some in a pooled environment. It's really your decision in terms of where that happens and how. 
But we see the infrastructure market going through massive amounts of change today. And we're not sure that you can really rely on the existing types of infrastructures or investments you've made around infrastructure for these next generation applications. A lot of them have run their course. We see convergence in integrated systems as a way to start to bridge the gap. But ultimately, where we're headed is into a world where these, these infrastructures are defined in software, and the resources behind that software are highly, highly modularized into some kind of a disaggregated resource pool. So that's the world that you'll be operating on in the next you know, three to five years. You need to prepare for that, but you also need to be having discussions with your uh, businesses about what their aspirations are for the business and how do they want to put that customer first and what does it mean for technology on the back end. So I know I, I probably went a little bit over, but... Um, <laughs> Great information. It was worth every second of it, don't you think? Come on, Matt Eastwood. Now comes a part, uh, I'll, I'll come out the mic, but I'd love, uh, Matt would love, he's got a few more minutes here to take some questions. If we don't get them all in, he, you're going to be around a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Uh, yep, so you can harass him in the parking my, lot. You can harass me on Twitter, too. Oh, yeah, oh, oh there, is it up there? Yes, it is. All right. Harass him on Twitter. All right, so uh, any hands up real quick, and I'll come around the mic right back here, sir. Give me a second. Come back with the mic. Uh, what is your name? Glenn Decker. Glenn, okay. Here's Decker. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, a couple slides back, you talked about IT efficiency, and it's going to save 25% uh, of people's time from an administrative perspective. When you're talking about integrated, what you call integrated, we call converged, I guess, sure, hybrid right. converged. Um, the, the general admin over time used to be able to be a network guy, a server guy, Windows guy. In the converged and integrated world, there's no such thing. You have to be an everything guy. Right. What's the impact? I mean, whose time are you saving 25% of? Obviously, these other admins that you used to have what are these guys doing, and do you see a differentiation between the enterprise and, say, mid-size enterprise and down? And Because it, it, I, the danger is of oversimplifying sure. those numbers, right? No, it's a great question, and I think you're, you're probably right to start with um, size of organization in that um, the mid-size organizations have probably, I think, have largely have already started to blend a lot of those roles. So you'll actually see people describing themselves as the virtualization kind of infrastructure administrator rather than compute storage network. They're, they're kind of blending those together. Um, I do think that even in larger organizations, we are talking about bringing these, res these resource groups together and, and doing a lot more cross-training. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. This is a, a kind of a journey, if you will, for the skill set in, in, in the data center. And so it's about bringing those, those folks together, but doing it in a way that aligns with how the technology is evolving. So if you still have big, expensive SANs in, in your organization, you're not going to get rid of your, your storage administrator. Um, but over time, the amount of application or amount of workload on that SAN could evolve and change, and so you, it might be an area where um, you want to dial it back. So without getting political, it's a, it's a bit kind of, like a, kind of like some of the challenges in a union shop where you have people that have very specific uh, roles and, and what you want to start to see. So I come out of uh, uh, the water wastewater world, and in wastewater and water treatment plants, you have electricians, and you have mechanical people, and you have all these specialties, but you have some jobs that you want to be able to abstract in a way that either can do. And I think you'll start to see more and more of that in the data center as the data centers prepare for this, this next generation infrastructure. But I, I, you're right. You don't, want to, you don't want to go too far with this too fast. You want to kind of marry it with what your infrastructure looks like and how that will evolve. Um, but clearly, how that infrastructure looks 10 years from now will be a lot different from how it looks today. So rather than clinging to it, it's starting to get out from under it. I like to remind people that there's, I've never talked to anybody that has too many IT people. It's just the opposite. There are too few. It's really about putting the people in the right place and really empowering them to take on new roles. And if you ask people whether or not VMware has created value or not, everyone that's in the, in the world of touching VMware in a data center will say it's ad, absolutely created value because it's put them in a position to really empower their, the job that they do. So that, that kind of a thinking a bit more broadly across storage and networking as well. And you know, if you don't mind, Matt, just because that was the first question of the day, sir, you have just earned yourself a red eight t-shirt for the first question of the day. Give him a big <laughs> hand. There you go. So we're going to be doing little things like that throughout the next couple days, so I, make sure you ask you, a lot of questions. You needed more red eight. Yeah, Rob's got one over here. Clothing in the, in the yes. closet, right? Hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, real, real quick, what, what are, who are some of the progressive companies, and what are, what are they doing to help make this transformation with their people? What are some of the things that they're doing to assist their people in making the transition with them? 
Well, I mean, a lot of it. Um, so I used, um, you know, kind of GE as a poster child, and <clears throat> they're probably as good as anyone. So GE advertises on CNBC now as a software company, right? So, so they're clearly um, articulating to the marketplace, whether it's the investor marketplace or, or the marketplace for, for staffing, that they want to be thought of differently than they, than they were, you know, five or 10 or 20 years ago. So they're putting a different spin on what they are and what they want to be and who they want to hire. So it, a lot of it comes down to what are the core, the core competencies that you want to bring in. But I think as much as it's about that, it's also about giving people in the organization the opportunity to retrain and grow and, and, and change. So again, it's hard to find qualified people in the, in the world of technology, and you want to give them a roadmap for evolving their skill sets and taking them in a new direction. So I think that's as important as anything. But it is about putting a little bit different spin on who you are in the marketplace as well. Richard, you have a question? I do. Matt, you like um, I have not. Sorry. Thank you very much, first oh, of all. Thanks for and, having me. Um, secondly, can you say more about GE's hours of power for jet engines? Red 8 has hours of power in the data center, and our Red 8 capital team, led by Scott Sullivan back here. Somewhere. Right, right. Um, I didn't know that they were doing capacity on demand for jet engines. We do capacity on demand for, computing, for the data for center. Storage, I'd love yeah. to hear some more about that. Yeah, so it's, um, it's it, so you, the other piece of GE that, depending upon how you think of GE, they're, they're, they're one of the biggest uh, uh, capital financers in the world as well. So they clearly get that space. They understand how to do operational leasing. What they're simply doing is, is trying to get people to consume their products differently. So I, I think today it's only about 8% or so of their overall jet engine capacity that's, that's acquired that way. But clearly they want to take that you know, deeper and deeper. And by holding on to those assets and putting that somewhat different operational model in place of, on top of that, then that gives them a, a really big business to, to generate more efficiencies off of and drive margins up. So rather than getting into that transactional discussion with you name your airline that's gonna be buying you know, jet engines by, by the dozens every year, they're getting into a conversation about, well we'll, hold, well, we'll take the capital off your books, we'll hold it, and we'll provide it to you in a way that ties to your business model, which for an airline is, is you know, seat miles. Mm -hmm. So they can do, easily do those, those correlations and takes the risk out of it for them. It puts the risk on GE, but if they do it well, they can actually drive the margin up. So it's actually very similar to what you guys are doing in the data center, but they're doing it for industrial products. Wow. Do we have one more? We have time, we'll squeeze one more in if somebody has one. Yes, sir, right over here, give me a second. Yeah. Matt, you touched a little bit earlier on moving from make, sell, to sense and respond, which doesn't sound all that simple. Are you seeing <laughs> on-ramps for folks trying to move to a sense and respond model because of the speed and the infrastructure and analytics that are required to do that? Um, it's a great question, and uh, it's an also a really great observation. I think it, it goes to uh, Richard's comment as well about GE, where you know, GE is putting billions of dollars into this. They're talking about building uh, multiple data centers in their own cloud and hiring all these people and they're still only at 8%, right? So it's not an easy trans transformation for people to do. If there are on-ramps, um, I guess it would be, um, y you wanna move You want to move in a way that's kind of uh, a, you know, incremental or adjacent to where you are. So it's very difficult for folks to start over here and jump over here like to the Uber model if you own a fleet of cars, for example. But what you would wanna do is, is create a customer experience for people that use your taxi service that's a lot more Uber-like. So you want to start to build, uh, you, can't, you can't eliminate the capital model that you have right away, but you can start to introduce new services to customers that change how they think of you and change how they use your service and then make you smarter in the end about how you deliver those services. So then all of a sudden if you're the taxi company that's making that transition, you can maybe figure out that you don't need as many physical cars to deliver the service, if you can start to optimize maybe how you deliver that service. So it's, I, I guess it's gonna depend on, it's gonna be unique for every industry, but it's gonna be about how you can move incrementally to improving the customer experience, but then also the outcome for the customer, make that better, and then you can start to, to move. But I think it's about putting together a plan for making that digital transformation, and what you think the gates and steps are along the way. Um, 
I think that's where you start to get into conversations with pretty deep uh, with management consultants and folks about what that might look like on the back end. But um, clearly, nobody moves from point A to point Z. They move incrementally. But, it's, it, but it, the last thing you want to do is say, I'm, not, I'm in a business that's not disruptable. I mean, you can literally see any industry potentially disrupted. So I, I was just toying around with a friend of mine about lawn service. You know, people enter into these engagements around lawn service on an annual basis. Well, what if, what if somebody decides that they're just going to put, them, put their business online and, and auction off those lawn services? You know, you, you go online and you hire somebody on the spot to come and do your lawn, and it's 85% of the price of the, of the service. You know, there are lots of ways to kind of look at disrupting existing industries and existing services. All right, Matt Eastwood, everybody, come on. Thank you, everybody.